In this review of the week's news, an end of an era for an historic ship, the saga continues over the jobbed coastal hazards report, and can they pull it off the ultimate challenge for some local students? This is CTV News Week in Review. I'm Jared McCulloch. It's been a tough week for the Kaipoi community when their beloved boat became beached at the Waimakaleli River mouth. The MV2 Hoi recently received nearly $250,000 worth of repairs to keep it afloat. But now after being stuck for nearly a week, the ship has now been deconstructed. The cleanup is nearly complete. Crews are racing around the clock to get the last of the stranded MV Tohoi off the bank of the Waimakariri river mouth. We've managed to break the vessel down to just the remaining part of the keel and the engines uh, and we're working to bring the engines and that part up the beach so that we can then remove the engines together, both engines. Uh, also we've got the spill response going on at the same time. So as it's an engine room, there is oily residue in the engine room. We've taken off the bulk of the oil but there's a little bit coming out and we're just cleaning up that up as we go. Piles of debris further up the beach are being made before high tide makes its way up later on today. We were beaten by the tide yesterday, it didn't go quite as quickly as we wanted it to, however we're hopeful that we will get it finished today. They managed to save iconic parts of the boat, one being the original mast of the Tohui and bits and bobs from the historic ship. We've been very lucky, the guys from March Demolition have been very careful how they deconstruct the boat, so they've managed to save the wheelhouse, the masts, the funnel came off in one piece today which was really quite good. Uh, they've saved the windlass, we've managing to save both engines as well. The 96-year-old ship was stranded on Sunday afternoon, returning home to Kaipoi after nearly $250,000 worth of repairs to keep it afloat. But all that's left now is what the deconstruction crew could save. The trust will actually have a real good quantity of items that they can put on display. And before they started the demolition, we actually managed to get the portholes, historic items, memorabilia off. So we're, we're really quite pleased with the amount we managed to save. It's really sad. It's a very sad event for everybody. Uh, all of the people who've been coming to visit and say hello uh, have been upset, really sad. Everybody's had a personal tale to tell about the vessel. Uh, the chaps who sailed on board it, each, each one of them will wander around the vessel and they'll point to bits and they'll tell you a story about it dating back 40 odd years. Something he says will be missed from the Kaipoi community. It's the last surviving vessel of its kind. It's, its involvement in World War II as well. It's huge, it really is. So it's, it's very sad to actually be involved in that. But in some ways, at least we've been able to do a little bit and save some of that for future generations. The pressure's on now for the crew behind me as they move the wreckage further up the beach before high tide comes in tonight. Tomorrow they'll make a decision of what happens next to the wreckage. Jared McCulloch, CTV News. And still with the MV2 Hoi, one local has been capturing every moment one snap at a time. The deconstruction of the MV Tohoi continued early this morning, and there too was one local snapping every moment of it. You've been up at the crack of dawn today, haven't you? I have. <laughs> Before sunrise. Anne Lamb has taken hundreds of photos over the past three days of the stricken ship, wanting to showcase her snaps in a short film. It takes quite a bit to do something like that. It's not just pull out 30 or 40 pictures. They've all got to be good ones and they've got to tell the story. Photography started out as a hobby, now it's her passion. Like older stuff, I'm really oh, into anything old. Old inside old wrecked houses and everything. Now she's adding to her collection of photos, taking snaps of the 96 year old ship for more than 10 years, coming into port at Kaiapoi. I was trying to um, go back on the hard drive yesterday and, and what a job, I had about four or five of them hooked up at once. I've still got another one or two to sort out through several big folders of the earthquake ones which I've stashed away somewhere. She's capturing its last moments before it's taken apart over the next few days, unable to be salvaged as a whole. They'd probably be able to preserve some of it somewhere. Um, it would have been nice to have seen it. Say, for instance, like you got the Thames in London and they have these permanent moorings for the old boats and that. Taking photos of the MV Tohoi was a way to keep her chugging along. Discovered I had a chronic illness. I thought, what am I going to do? Photography. Get my mind off of the things and outside of yourself. And, and I got very competitive very quickly. Non-Pacific pneumonitis. It's scarring of the lungs. Thing, and I have oxygen at night, but... I managed to work around that to do what I have to do. My son watching over there and he's keeping an eye on his old mother. 
She's put forth her photos in numerous competitions and she even has one for sale at a local cafe. The people sort of stuff too is in their environment and the candid style of stuff. And I, I also like bird photography, anything I'll point my camera at. And I've travelled a bit and I've seen a lot of, and I like older stuff. I'm really oh, into anything old. And she's not giving up her love for photography anytime soon. Not until they bloody drop me in the hole. <laughs> Getting the best shot to capture a moment in time. Jared McCulloch, CGV News. A South Shore resident believes the saga over the controversial coastal hazards report still has a long way to go. The report was dropped and will now start from scratch. But the aftermath of the process is still affecting many beachside residents, holding up the rebuilds and repairs. It may be a picturesque day out in South Shore, but the problems surrounding coastal erosion are still on the minds of many. The controversial coastal hazards report was scrapped in its third stage, affecting around 18,000 properties on seaside areas across the city. Central government has stepped in to halt the process, wanting the issue to go through the council's normal plan review process. Although a win for many, one resident says there's still a long way to go. Getting building consent and resource consent, um, that's still on the limb. We still have to go through, um, you know, it's... it's like having a harness on ourselves and we're really stressed. I didn't sleep all last night because we're just so worried and so concerned. Some homeowners are still having issues with their limb reports, meaning they'll have difficulties with their earthquake repairs, rebuilds and may have problems for future construction plans. Since it's been really our biggest concern about how that affects us all and what those ramifications are, which we still all have yet to find out. Capity, the residents had it put on their limbs and they were successful, they legally challenged it and had it removed. Um, so we're kind of taking some advice from that. Carbourne's home is a rebuild. She was lucky to be granted resource consent before the Coastal Hazards Report labelled others with the sea rise and erosion issues. But she's calling on council to reassess the report completely and start from scratch. We'd really like council to take into account that um, they didn't consult with residents at this earlier stage of the report that came out and um, the, the basis of the report is um, the Tonkin and Taylor report and we have never been consulted about it. The risk to homes is rising sea levels and erosion over the next 50 to 100 years, so she wants council to act sooner rather than later. We'll hope for a miracle and hope those councillors see sense and, um, you know, we'd love to get a really good scientific report about our area that you know, is factually correct. Another hurdle in an already stressful rebuild for residents, desperate for answers and action. Jared McCulloch, CTV News. Still to come, a remembrance service is held for fallen police officers. Welcome back. Forestry, it's a $5 billion industry and the Christchurch Technology Company believes it can double that number in the near future. Chelsea Daniels reports. A Christchurch company is leading the way in making the forestry industry more safe and profitable for New Zealand. We've been developing the Hitman tool um, for about 15 years now and there's um, this hand tools that the guys need to use on the ground and we're just putting that technology into a harvester head so it'll be fully automated. Well, here in Glen Tui, Canterbury, their goal is 200 tonnes of wood each and every day. In all weather conditions, as you can see here, only making conditions for the workers even more unsafe. Nigel Sharplin of Fibergen says last year alone 10 people lost their lives in the industry, a completely avoidable number. In most countries around the world, uh, forestry harvesting operations are fully automated. Uh, you're not allowed men on the ground. Uh, in New Zealand, unfortunately, we've got some pretty tough conditions, a lot of uh, hill country and it makes it pretty tough. But this uh, type of technology that we've developed um, means that we can get people in cabs. Away from danger. 
And he says we can use the best wood products in the Christchurch rebuild, shipping the rest off to overseas buyers. So the Hitman technology uh, is all about getting the right wood to the right processing operation. Currently when trees are harvested, there's no way of measuring the quality of the wood. And so uh, the logs are sent to a wood processor and uh, we don't extract the most value out of that. So this technology enables um, forestry companies to uh, measure the wood and send it to the right mill and make sure that they get the most value. He says the new technology brings not only substantial financial benefits, but it reduces risk to life in the forestry industry. We're trying to bring technology that puts uh, the worker back in the cab, so we've developed automatic testing equipment for uh, measuring log properties. It's a Canterbury product developed by local researchers and technology experts, and it's gained worldwide recognition. Hitman technology has been a, um, a collaborative effort um, by research organisations and a lot of forestry companies in New Zealand have helped us to develop this technology. Chelsea Daniels, CTV News. A day of reflection for police across the country this week with the annual remembrance service recognising those who died in the line of duty. This year they're also recognising those who have served for the police but have since passed. A tribute to the men and women in blue. Canterbury Police took the time to reflect today on the officers who lost their lives in duty and for the first time this year they honoured the men and women who served but have since passed. Usually the annual Police Remembrance Day service recognised the 29 who were killed on duty as a result of a criminal act since its establishment back in 1886. Today, police staff throughout New Zealand, Australia and the Pacific Islands take part on Remembrance Day. We do this every day on the 29th of November. To remember, to honour. One Cantabrian who was recognised was a member of the Christchurch Child Protection Unit who died in the collapse of the CTV building in the February 2011 earthquake. Pamela Marie Bryan died 22nd of February 2011. And a Timaru sergeant was also honoured, serving at the New Zealand Police for nearly 30 years. Senior Sergeant Kohi Randall Teota Tiki Tiki Timaru, years of service 1986 to 2015. May they rest in peace as our fallen peacemakers who have made the ultimate sacrifice. Then the 38 employees' names were read one by one. Constable Graham Stewart Wackrow died 25th of March 1984. Constable Glenn Andrew Hughes died 2nd of July 1986. Sergeant Archibald McPhee died 20 January 1910. Constable Dennis Maloney, Mahoney died 29 March 1914. Followed by a minute silence. From my heart I thank you for bringing peace to our community and I ask that we always keep ourselves safe. All I want is each one of you to come home at the end of your duty safely to your loved ones. A day to reflect. Jared McCulloch, CTV News. A Canterbury Vet Centre has become the country's first to receive a top award for feline friendliness. Gordon Finlater went out this week to see how the clinic got the tick of perfection. Rangiora Vet Centre can now call themselves the country's friendliest feline clinic after receiving New Zealand's first international cat-friendly gold level accreditation. I spoke to vet nurse Kim Anderson about what's required to receive the gold mark. Out in our waiting room we've got a cat only waiting area so they're not sitting with a dogs at any time um, while they're waiting for their appointments or to see a vet. From there it's into the cat hospital where the feline friends are treated to the comfortable waiting room. As you can see by the cages they're all you know, very spacious, so they're quite big. They all get litter trays. Um, we have hidey houses for the, for the really shy cats that need that extra bit of protection. Um, they have their own bedding, food and water. We have special diets for individual cats. Um, 
yeah, so they come in here before surgery, um, after surgery, or if they're sick, and they just stay in this room exclusively. Some of the cats even have their own IV drip. We've got fluid pumps, so we're, you know, we're monitoring the flow rate of all our fluids that are going in. Um, so if we need to add medication, we can do it at a controlled measure. The feline hospital isn't just used for procedures on your average ginger tom. Some of Arana Park's largest wild cats will be treated at the clinic. And it's not just the Arana cats being looked after, with one of Rangiora's veterinarians now working with the park's new gorillas. So how does one become a gorilla vet. They don't teach you it at Massey, so I spent long enough getting my degree up at Massey and then uh, came out of that doing large animal practice and then so the gorilla thing has been a specialisation. Well, I guess it's, you can't call myself a specialist, but it's, it's extra training. Uh, so m most of it was at Taronga Zoo over in Sydney and working directly with gorillas hands on, doing anaesthetics, doing health checks, TB testing. Making regular visits to the park, Davidson's average day at the office has now taken a shift. They're obviously a big animal that you're not going to be um, hands on with, so I can't touch them like I you know, touch cows and horses every day to find out what's going on with them. So a lot of it's observation, so I rely a lot on the keepers. So are they eating uh, the same that they ate the day before? Has there been any changes in uh, obvious signs, like you know, coughing or uh, th those sorts of signs? And with the species growing to between 140 and 180 kilograms, getting the patients on the table is no easy task. Uh, these guys have been trained up for hand injections, but um, it would be nice to think that we could do that. So that'll take a bit of work from me to go in and just get familiar with these guys and uh, you know, be doing some touching through the bars and stuff. Just hopefully we can manage that because uh, gorillas don't like darts being fired at them and they get a bit stroppy and it can be quite a you know, stressful experience for everyone. So we'd try and avoid um, darts if we could, uh, but if we need to, we would. And, uh, and then it's uh, a full team and quite a full on procedure to get uh, you know, th those gorillas into the, onto the anaesthetic tables, surgery tables and then and, and work with them. He is hoping the only darts Davidson will be throwing in the near future are at the pub. Gordon Findlater, CTV oh, News. Still to come, Kai Poi students put their strength to the test. Welcome back. Keeping fit can be tough for many busy Cantabrians and some of these local students will make you feel worse knowing they've successfully pulled not one but two fire trucks down one of Kaipoi's busiest roads. It's not something you see every day. But it's been on the minds of these students taking on the ultimate challenge. The programme Cactus sees students from year 9 to 13 working to improve their skills both physically and mentally as they take on boot camp challenges, building up to their final task, pulling not one, but two fire trucks. Really hard. I was I feel so dead. But it was good. It was worth it. Well, these guys have turned up at about 20 past 6 for 10 weeks and they'll go from 20 past 6 till half past 7. On the first day, there's a lot of them that absolutely hate it. Uh, a few tears, a few people vomiting, almost passing out, but they come back and they get fitter. And although pulling fire trucks is tough, getting up early, well, that's another challenge in itself. I slept through my alarm a couple of times. I had to get the mother to um, come wake me up. But, you know, um, about the third or fourth week into it, you, you just start getting used to it. You start looking forward to getting up. The kids that didn't know each other at the start, and now they're sort of all friends and they'll be like that. It's sort of something they've, they've done together and they'll know each other. You'll probably see them when they're 25, 30, walking down the road. And I, did, I did the cactus program with them. The cause first took shape further north in Blenheim a few years back, developed by the Police Blue Light Youth Scheme. Well over 200 students have taken part from Kaiapoi High School over the past two years, 
aiming to succeed. They probably couldn't do five press-ups. They will go out and, and bust out to 100 in, in, in a short space of 10 weeks. So not only that sort of side of fitness, but the whole team thing, that their, their schoolings also help with it. So I didn't find the physical thing, side of it challenging, but I found waking up early in the morning, um, being a team, because I do individual sports, so working together with all different range of um, abilities, which was quite good. I've just been wanting to do it for a long time. Since I first see them pulling the fire truck and stuff, I was like, that's a good challenge for me and because I want to go into the police force and stuff. And it's been so popular some pupils have gone through the program more than once. This is actually my second time doing it. Um, yeah I was privileged enough to have the opportunity to do this again. It's just a sense of achievement for finishing something that you'd never think you'd be able to finish. But I mean um, also it's just to get like your fitness levels up and it's just to really just improve on yourself. We used to have an ex-army instructor take it, now we've got um, Ken Franks from CrossFit taking it. Um, so different sort of focuses, but equally as hard and the same sort of philosophy behind it. And after their exhausting day, some would still be keen for round two. Yeah, I would, yeah. Yes, definitely. Would. So their next challenge, maybe three fire trucks? The council said we're not allowed three. <laughs> <laughs> But for now, it's time for rest and a job well done. Jared McCulloch, CTV News. To celebrate International Day of the Older Persons, some elderly folk went back to school for the annual Positive Ageing Expo. Gordon Finlater explains. School's out for term holidays and the seniors are taking over. The Positive Ageing Expo is put together by Age Concerned Canterbury and the event is one of the biggest on their calendar. We have a, a team on it who spend many, many weeks getting prepared for this. We've got nearly 150 exhibitors here today and um, probably you know, many, many thousands of people that have uh, come through to enjoy the day and, and meet the exhibitors and see what's out there and available for older people. Now well established, year by year the Expo is continuing to grow. Age Concern Canterbury have been running it for uh, 9 or 10 years now and it certainly has grown every year and it does get bigger. Uh, this year we've had to have the marquees um, out here that you can see because we've just filled up with um, all the gyms and, and the rooms are all filled up with exhibitors. One of those exhibitors is the Wainoni Avonside Community Services Trust. We wandered inside to find the team getting down to some Zumba. The lady behind all this fun is the community's coordinator, Betty Chapman. The message from the Trust is all about having a good time. Our group today has sung. We've sung um, some fun earthquake songs to when the Saints come marching in. We change it to EQC and the builders and the painters and the movers. And when the EQ check comes rolling in, we want to be in that number too. And then we did half a dozen Zumba numbers here as well. A weekly Zumba class is just one of many activities run by the Trust. And after today's free class, there may be a few new faces showing up in the future. Future. Some bodies may not be as agile as they used to, but age has no effect on the group's enthusiasm. It doesn't matter as long as you can move a little. And it's good brain gym, you know, you're like you're crossing, crossing over all the time. It's very good brain gym, it's excellent. And, it's, and also with exercise you release the endorphins and, and you feel a bit happier in yourself. And sometimes it's a lonely place being older, you know, living alone. Sometimes it's quite lonely and quite a dark place at times. Yeah, but you get things like this and that brightens them up. And it's community groups like Betty's that make the Positive Ageing Expo such a success. The feedback we hear most is from older people is coming here and seeing everything that's available for them. Uh, they find it remarkable how many groups and organisations there are that they can be a part of and belong to. So that's a real one of the successes of the day. If you missed out, the event is sure to be back next year. Make sure you bring your trainers though, just in case you happen to stumble across some impromptu Zumba. Gordon Findlater, CTV News. And that is CTV News Week in Review. I'm Jared McCulloch. Have a great weekend.
Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.